Okay, we're back in First Timothy. And um, looking at verse 2, 1 Timothy chapter 1, we made it to verse 2. It says, Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. So this is Paul the Apostle unto Timothy, his protege, his son in the faith, he calls him. You know, he called him his fellow laborer. He called him a brother. The only one that Paul calls a man of God, Timothy. So let's look at some more stuff about Timothy. Look at Acts 16 and verse 1. If you'll turn over to Acts 16 and verse 1, and like I said, doing something different with this, trying to slow it down, give you the chance to turn to these verses. That way you can get used to turning in the Bible. So Acts 16, 1. And I'm going to show you something about Timothy. And you want to get to know these Bible characters. Make these Bible characters your friend. And the more familiar you get with them, the more the Bible is going to just come alive to you. And you're going to be more and more interested in it. So Acts 16.1. So it says, In Acts 16.1, Then came he to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus. Now, when you see Timotheus, that's Timothy. The son of a certain, certain woman, which was a Jewish, Jewish, and believed but his father was a Greek. So Timothy's mother is a Jewess. And we talked about how uh, his mother's name last week. We talked about how he, his grandmother Eunice and his mother Lois last week. And they brought him up in the faith. Yeah, his mother Eunice and his grandmother Lois. They brought him up in the faith. You know, he had a good mom and a good grandmother. His father may not have even been saved, but he had a good grandmother and a good mom. And Timothy was half Jew and half Gentile, Acts 16.1. And he cares for the state of the saints. Let's just look at some more things about Timothy here. Look at Philippians 2.19-20. Philippians 2.19-20. I'm going to show you some more about Timothy. Since he's coming up in the verse here, look at Philippians 2, 19 through 20. One of the greatest things you can do is just flip through the Bible. There's nothing like it. It's Philippians 2, 19 through 20. It says, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. But you know the proof of him that as a son with the Father, he hath served with me in the gospel. Him, therefore, I hope to send presently so soon as I shall see how it will go with thee. So you see, Timothy cared for the state of the saints when nobody else did. And that's who Paul has confidence in to send to the Philippians. And he's, he's faithful. It talks about in 2 Timothy 1.5 that Timothy is faithful. He's a young man, as it talks about in 1 Timothy 4.12. Now... <clears throat> He possibly had a problem with fear. You know, every, we all got something we can improve on. Timothy possibly had a problem with fear. Look at 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 10. 1 You know, we've all got something we can work on. And if you look at 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 10... I'll show you why I believe Timothy could have had a problem with fear. Let 
It says, Now if Timotheus come, see that he may be with you without fear, for he worketh the work of the Lord, as I also do. Timothy, although he had faith, although he was cared for the state of the saints, he could have struggled with fear. Look at 2 Timothy 1.7. In 2 Timothy 1, 7, he says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That's who Paul says that famous verse to is to Timothy. He says, you know, God's not given us the spirit of fear. You know, you don't want to walk around in this constant state of fear. And that's what you see people doing today. Every time I talk to people, about the Bible, they don't talk to me about the Bible. They start talking to me about stuff that's on the news. They start talking to me about stuff they've seen on TikTok, all these conspiracy stuff, stuff about Russia, stuff about China, all this stuff that's just giving them the spirit of fear. They don't talk to you about the Bible. They talk about how, you know, it's the, it's the last days, they don't talk about anything in the Bible that refers to the last days, really. But they just start talking about stuff that makes them full of fear. But Paul told Timothy, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. You see, the conspiracy stuff, and all that stuff that's out of your control, that makes you feel powerless. And... There's no love in it. And it doesn't give you a sound mind. It's the further you get off into the conspiracy stuff most times, just the further you're going to get away from a sound mind. And I'm not saying a lot of the conspiracy stuff ain't true, but you can get off into some crazy stuff with the conspiracy stuff and you're going to lose that sound mind that the scriptures can give you. The, the Bible makes you think very clear and plain. And when you look at the Bible and believe it, and you know you're saved, you know you're going to heaven, and you know that God is in you, and you're in Him, it'll take away a lot of your fears. Timothy could have struggled with some fear. And possibly could have lacked toughness. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse, verse 3. 2 Timothy 2, 3. Paul tells Timothy, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. You know, Timothy uh, had a lot of faith. Timothy loved the saints. But he tells them to endure hardness. As a good soldier of Jesus Christ. He tells them to not have the spirit of fear. So maybe he was a little bit afraid. Maybe he lacked a little bit of toughness. We all got something that we need to improve upon. And maybe he lacked toughness. And maybe he also had a problem with his physical health. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 23. It's possible that Timothy... Had some trouble with his physical health in uh, 1 Timothy 5.23. He tells Timothy to drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. So possibly, Timothy struggled with some stomach problems. And the Lord will let you struggle with health problems to just keep you humble, to keep you reliant on Him, just like He did with Paul. Paul had some problems you know he says his bodily presence is weak he you know and, and somebody that's been whipped that many times and stoned i'd say he was feeling not the best in the world so god will let you go through some physical troubles some physical pain in this life so you rely on him because you know like paul says 
His strength is made perfect in weakness. So Timothy, he cared for the state of the saints. He was faithful. He was a young man, possibly had a problem with fear, possibly lacked toughness, possibly had physical problems. And he is Paul's son in the faith. And they met in Lystra, as it talks about back there in Acts 16, 1 through 3. So Timothy, my own son in the faith. You know, just like Paul talks about in Corinthians, how he has begotten them through the gospel. And that's the way it was with Timothy. It says in 1 Corinthians 4.15, he says, For though ye have ten thousand instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. He talks about in uh, Philemon, verse 10, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. So, Timothy, led to the Lord by Paul, he's his own son in the faith. The people you lead to the Lord are your son or daughter in the faith. So he says, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. So what about grace? What is grace? Well, grace is God giving you something that you don't deserve. And that's what he's done for us through salvation. But then at the same time, after you're saved, you need a daily grace. Look at 2 Peter 3.18. In 2 Peter 3.18 it talks about growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But let's go ahead and look at it. I'm going to give you time to turn to it. 2 Peter 3.18. 2 Peter 3.18 says, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. See, you got saved by grace, and after salvation, you need a daily growth in grace. You need to grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And how do you do that? Through much study. Growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the more you read this Bible, the more you're going to know the Lord. You go back there through the Old Testament, find Jesus on every page, figure out how all the stories are a picture of the Lord, go through the Gospels, walk and talk with Jesus in his earthly ministry, go through the Pauline epistles, and be ye a follower of Paul as he follows who? The Lord Jesus Christ. You get over there in Hebrews, figure out how he's your high priest you get there in Revelation, see how he's coming back. You grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a hymn book. It's all about him. So, unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy. Okay, what's mercy? Mercy is God keeping you from something that you do deserve. You know, what did the rich man say in Luke 16, 24? He said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I'm tormented in this flame. You know, you want mercy. And that's what you got at salvation. God kept you from the same fate as the rich man. He's begging for mercy right now. Mercy. God giving you some, God keeping you from something you don't deserve. Grace, God giving you something you don't deserve. And you need a daily mercy. I need mercy every day because I just, I have problems every day. Just with simple things. I struggle with simple things. I've always struggled with simple things. I, if it wasn't for God, I don't even think I would be alive today. I've just struggled through life. But God's given me grace and mercy and peace. Okay, what about peace? Well, when you got saved, you got peace with God. God, 
He got peace with you. You didn't have peace with him before you were saved. You were at enmity with one another. But when you got saved, the Lord Jesus Christ took your hand. He took the Father's hand and he put them together. And he brought peace. He, he's our propitiation. He appeased the wrath of God. We were at enmity with each other. And he reconciled us. Now we got peace with God. And then look at Philippians 4, 7. And I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you the peace of God. Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 7. Really famous verse here. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So this is something you got after you're saved because it's through Christ Jesus and it's the peace of God. When you got saved, you got peace with God. And then after you're saved daily, you have the peace of God. And it passes all understanding. And how do you get peace of God? Well, look at verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. That's how you have the peace of God. You think on things that are of God, and it's the Bible. You think on the words of God, you're going to have peace. You spend all your time looking at conspiracies, looking at conspiracy YouTube, conspiracy TikTok, you're not going to have a sound mind and you're not going to have the peace of God. You're going to walk around in a state of fear. And God's not giving us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You need to spend more time in the book than you do in conspiracies. I'm not completely against them. Looking at them, you know, be, having an understanding of them, being aware of them. But when it comes right down to it, you got to, Christians spending way too much time on that. And... It's you're wasting all your time on that when you could be in the book getting the peace of God. So, unto Timothy, my own son of the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. And that's where that's where you get it, is from the Lord. So Timothy, Paul's son in the faith. In verse 3, as I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went to Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. You see this? Paul is all about doctrine. That's his primary thing is about doctrine. You know how you make the Bible come alive to people? You teach them doctrine. I mean, the mo devotional stuff is great. The milk of the word is great. But you give them doctrine, especially the men, you give them doctrine, you'll get them interested in the word. Doctrine makes the Bible come alive. It gives them a, a foundation to build upon. You teach them those, those doctrines, those basic doctrines of the Bible even, you're giving them something to stand on. And they won't be led astray. The biggest problem today that you see with Christians, they don't know any doctrine at all. That's why they can be so easily deceived, so easily carried off into this crazy stuff that they see on social media and on YouTube and on the news. They just get carried away. They get tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. But you get your people into the doctrine. And they can rest in the truth. So he is telling Timothy. He told Timothy that as I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus. Now Paul encourages him to stay. He, he was a, he, Timothy was pastor of the church in Ephesus. And Paul first went to Ephesus on his first missionary journey. 
In Acts 18, 19 through 21, <clears throat> he came back on his third missionary journey, Acts 19, 1. And, you know, consistency is key. Trying to stay put in the same place and live for God in that same place. For example, uh, my pastor has been at the same place, the same church, since 1994. So you're looking at almost 30 years in the same place. He's been married to the same woman, I guess, 50, so, 50 or so years. Worked at the same job uh, at a factory for 42 years. Been studying the Bible for 40-something years. Consistency is key. Getting where God wants you to be, staying there, staying put. And you stay there, stay put. You can grow. You can build something there. Consistency is key. Not bouncing around from one thing to another. And even when it comes to the doctrine here, not only does he want them to abide still at Ephesus, he wants them to teach no other doctrine. Consistency. You know, not jumping along the bandwagon with the new doctrine that comes up. You know, all the time you got a, a new... If, you're, if you talk to Bible believers out there, you know, especially on the internet, they've always got some new doctrine that pops up. And a lot of them will run to that, jump on the bandwagon for that new doctrine. And, <clears throat> you know, every now and then, maybe somebody does find something we've been teaching wrong all these years. But for the most part, we're teaching the same stuff that they've been teaching all throughout church history. Very rarely ever do you really find something that we've been teaching wrong for all this church time of church history and paul charges him paul wants timothy to charge some that they teach no other doctrine consistency is key make sure you stick to the truth don't teach no other doctrine don't be tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine so the main thing is teaching no other doctrine wrong doctrine brings wrong behavior and he, he charges him. A charge is a military command. And you'll notice Paul refers to him as a soldier. Paul talks about endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Paul talks about how uh, that thou may please him who hath chosen us to be a soldier. And he uses that word charge many times. Let's look at that word charge. Let's look at <clears throat> one eighteen. He says, this charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest, look at this, war a good warfare. As a Christian, you're in a war. You're a soldier in the Lord's army. Ephesians 6 talks about how we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. It's a war. And we're wrestling against spiritual wickedness in high places. And he charges him. Let's look at another one. That was 118. We done seen it in 1-3. That was 118. And now, look at 5-7. 1 Timothy 5-7. He, he says, And these things give in charge that they may be blameless. Look at 5, 1 Timothy 5, and verse 21. 1 Timothy 5, 21. He says, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels, that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. So doing these things without respect to persons. He charges him. Not to have respect to persons there. And then 6.13. He says, I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate went to witness a good profession. And then in 6.17. 
He said, charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in certain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Charge them. You know, he's talking about charging the rich people. Give a command with authority. It's a military command. <clears throat> Paul is very authoritative with what he says. He wants to Timothy to charge, you know, the teachers and pastors that he is mentor over to charge them that they teach no other doctrine. Then he says, Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith, so do. So neither give heed to fables. So don't give heed. If you give heed to something, that means you're paying attention to it. Don't pay attention to fables. You know why? Because fables, all they do is minister questions. Fables are doctrines based on lies. And look at Acts 15, 1 through 5. I'm going to give you an example of a fable. And there's a lot of fables going on in this world that people are teaching. It's very bad. I mean, you talk you talk to people. I've had people tell me that I don't have the Holy Spirit because I don't speak in tongues. I've had people tell me that I'm not saved because I wasn't baptized in the Church of Christ church building. I've had people tell me that I wasn't saved because I wasn't baptized in Jesus' name only. All this stuff is fables. I'm going to give you an example of one in the Bible. Acts 15, 1 through 5. Acts 15 and verse 1. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. That's a fable. Adding physical circumcision to salvation. Saying they're not saved unless they've been physically circumcised after the manner of Moses. He's, and then it says, When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small decision and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem and to the apostles and elders about this question. And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phinas and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So that's a fable teaching that they had to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses to be saved or to stay saved is a fable. Teaching that you got to be baptized in water to be saved, that's a fable. And it just it ministers questions. Ministering questions is fables. You see, a lot of stuff that people's teaching, it doesn't get you established in truth. It just leads to more and more questions. So neither give heed to fables. Look at Titus 1.14. Titus is another pastoral epistle. So he's going to be obviously giving Titus a lot of good stuff for pastors of local churches. Titus 1.14, he tells him not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. You see, when somebody's going around teaching for doctrine, the commandments of men, that's fables. And <clears throat> the Pharisees did not really care about the law. They taught for doctrine, the commandments of men. They, they put their own tradition over the, over the commandments of God. And see, when you go somewhere... And somebody is is giving you their all they do is preach the tradition. That's fables, and it doesn't give you a good foundation of doctrine. Usually, the average church you go into, they're teaching the tr the tradition of the denomination they're in, not Bible doctrine. 
and you know you get it, you just listen to uh, uh, just any a lot of uh, pastors and preachers they're teaching tradition like you you'll hear just for example a lot of stuff on clothes the clothes you wear if you don't have on a tie they say you're a compromiser things like that it's just nonsense stuff complete nonsense where is that in the bible that a person must wear a tie whenever you're teaching something that a person has to do something that you can't show them in the bible you're teaching them a commandment of men a tradition and that's all that most of them are doing. They're, tr they're teaching the tradition of their denomination and making that apply to a person saying they're not right with God if they don't keep that tradition or that they're not saved if they don't keep that tradition. And that's just fables. Don't give heed to fables. Don't pay attention to fables. And in the endless genealogies, endless genealogies, just ministers questions. You, you start looking at genealogies, it just leads to a whole bunch of questions that can lead to a bunch of doubt. And that's what a lot of people were doing, looking at endless genealogies. And they'll get you to question, they'll try to get you to question the Bible with these genealogies. And they'll profess to have found errors in these endless genealogies. And then you got even people that think they're saved because of who's in their family line. For example, Matthew 3, 9, he says, And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. You know, they were going around saying, you know, well, Abraham's our father. Thinking that, that they were right with God just because of who their father was. Those Pharisees and those people, they thought, well, I'm right with God. Abraham is my father. Just like today, a lot of times people think they're right with God because maybe their father is a pastor. Maybe their father is some big shot at a school or in church or something. Don't give heed to fables and endless genealogies. And even like the Corinthians, what were they doing? They was arguing over who was better because of who they got baptized by. And Paul Paul is like, I'm glad that I baptized none of you. Thus, you should say, you know, you're right with God because of me, basically. And then, and like, in 1 Corinthians 1.12, he says, Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in my own name. And they were just going around talking about who they, they were saved under and thought that they were more right with God because of who they got saved under. And that has nothing to do with it. Your spiritual genealogy, nor your physical genealogy, does not make you more right with God. It doesn't make you more right with God just because you got saved under a really good Bible teacher. You know, you got a lot of people today, a lot of division in amongst Bible believers because of who their teacher is, who they sit under. For example, you got people that think they're more right with God because their teacher was Peter Ruckman. Or then you got these other guys, they think they're more out of God because their teacher is James Knox. Or you got these other people that think they're more right with God because they sit under somebody like Sammy Allen or Harold, Harold Seitler or Steven Anderson or maybe they <clears throat> got into Bible-believing stuff on YouTube and some of them sit under Robert Breaker or Gene Kim. You know, just, and, and they think they're more right with God because of who their teacher is, and they hold to those certain doctrines that this certain camp holds to, and they just give heed to fables and endless genealogies many times, which minister questions rather than godly edifying. You know, 
teaching a bunch of stuff that only leads to more questions doesn't really edify somebody. When you teach stuff that shows them absolute truth and something that they can rest on and have faith in it and no doubt in it, it that's the greatest thing you can do. And, you know, I talk to a lot of people about the Bible. They have no absolute truth. They have no rest in what they believe. For example, once again, I keep talking about this, but it's like a plague. The TikTok, YouTube type stuff, that's where people's getting their, all their teaching, all their doctrine from. It's sad. They're not getting into the Bible. They don't have a good Bible-believing teacher. They're like a, a sheep with no shepherd. And this one guy, he just keeps... He'll keep saying to me, you know, what if this? What if that? What if this? He said, you know, what if that light you see when you die, that light at the end of the tunnel is the light in the hospital and that you being born <clears throat> in a new life, like reincarnation. And you're crying when you're born because that's your memory of your past life being wiped away. He said, I believe in God, I believe in the Bible, but what if that? Well, that's crazy. You can't live your life off of a what if. And if that was true, then the Bible wouldn't be right. We know that's not true. Reincarnation is not true. You got one life to live. And after this, the judgment. So, he's living off of a what if. That's not our absolute truth. That's just something. He's into stuff that's ministering questions, not godly edifying. Then you've got you've got uh, the new Bibles that just leads to more questions. There's no truth in it. I mean, you can find the Word of God in those Bibles, but it's not. But it's not absolute truth. They have no rest. They can't just go to the Bible and say. This is in the Bible. I believe this whole thing 100%. They don't do that because they don't believe that there is a perfect Bible. They believe in good translations and bad translations. But if you're, if you're a Bible believer, then you know that God has a perfect Bible preserved all the way up to you today. That's absolute truth. You can rest in that and not have any doubt. The conspiracy stuff ministers questions. That's all it does. The These churches that are completely based on emotion and feelings, that ministers questions because you're always living on your feeling. I don't feel saved today. Maybe I lost my salvation. You know, the, the emotional stuff leads to that, how you feel. You're always going to feel different from one time to the next. It's not about how you feel. It's about what the Bible said. So, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith. If you can show somebody how to have faith, what they can place their absolute faith in, that's edifying. And people's not doing that. They're just more so ministering questions, causing more problems. Fables are those doctrines based on lies, commandments of men, things like that. He says, Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. Now the end of the commandment. What's the end of the commandment is purpose or the result of it the re the result of getting the word of god in you is charity out of a pure heart you get the word of god in you you're going to have charity out of a pure heart charity is love specifically towards other christians the more bible you get in you the more you're going to love god and god's people and you're going to have a, a, a good conscience and faith unfeigned Paul talks a lot about having a good conscience. And if you got a good conscience, you're free of unconfessed and unchecked sin. 
And the more Bible you get in you, you see, it's hard to read the Bible every day and study the Bible every day with a bad conscience. Because every time you come to the Bible, you know, every time I come to the Bible, I'm, God, I'm like, God, forgive me for the bad things I did yesterday. And the bad thing, you know, all, just it makes you want to confess your sin. It makes you want to get right with God when you get into the Bible. You know, it's like it says in Psalms, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Just like Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5. Talking about the word of God, talking about the church and the Lord, he says, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. The end of the commandment, the result of the word of God is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and a faith unfeigned. Faith unfeigned is not pretended faith. If you're staying in the Bible, you don't have to pretend being right with God. You don't have to pretend to be a Bible believer. You don't have to pretend all this stuff. You know, when you go to your average local church, what do you see? You see faith feigned, faith that is pretend. You see a show many times. You can tell people are acting churchy and stuff. And it's just a fake show and by the things that they say. But you, you, you can tell somebody that's staying in the book, that's in the book, because they got faith unfeigned, faith that's not pretended. And that's the end result of the Word of God. Charity. Love towards other Christians. Out of a pure heart. Thinking on, on whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely. A good conscience. You got your sin in check. You got your sins confessed up. From which some having swerved have turned aside unto vain jangling. Empty talk. It's vain. A lot of the things that they're saying. Vain jangling could also be, you know, going back to those fables. It's just empty talk. Look at Galatians 2.21. In Galatians 2.21. It says, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Teaching that you're saved by the law, saved by works. All you're doing is vain jangling. This empty talk, it just, you're leading, you're just ministering questions. You're not establishing people and giving them godly edifying, which is in faith. You're making people have doubt. By making people look at their self and their own works to prove they're saved or to get saved, you're leading to just uncertain Uncertain thoughts, not absolute truth, not something they can rest in. So vain jangling, empty, pointless stories and talking. It's just a lot of times you'll listen to somebody. They're not giving you the word of God. They're just vain jangling, a bunch of empty talk. Really, they're wasting your time. They'll talk about how you need to come and hear them. Every Sunday, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night, they're giving you a bunch of empty, vain jangling, wasting your time. If you got all these people that's coming to hear you, give them the Bible. Enough with all the just vain, jangling, empty talk. And it because this stuff can cause people to swerve. Basically, get off the road into dangerous doctrine. For example... Here's some examples, and once again, going back to the conspiracy stuff that everybody's all into today, here's some examples of vain jangling that Christians are giving other Christians. For example, we're living in a simulation. I've, I've heard Christians teaching that we're living in a simulation. Now, how does that line up with the Bible? We're not living in a simulation. What you're seeing is real. 
this is all real and it's serious. People are going to go to hell or heaven if they don't believe, if they get, if what, de determining on what they do with the gospel. They're going to go to heaven or they're going to go to hell. It's real. This is not a simulation. You're going to get rewards or lack thereof at the judgment seat of Christ. What you're seeing is real. It's got real consequences. You're not just living in a simulation. Another thing, you got pastors teaching that the vaccines are the mark of the beast. And that if you have gotten a vaccine, then you've got the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast does not show up until the beast shows up. The mark of the beast does not show up until the church is gone. You know, I'm not saying I'm for vaccines, the vaccine, but I'm not going to go around and teach that it's the mark of the beast either. That is vain jangling. Teaching man is justified by the law is vain jangling. And that's what you're getting. They're not giving you the word of God no more. They're giving you the commandments of men. They're giving you conspiracy theories. They're giving you a bunch of pointless stories that it's like, you know, they got these same stories that they say over and over again. And each time they, they embellish them a little bit more and exaggerate them a little bit more till it ends up being a story that sounds just so unrealistic that didn't even happen. A lot of like the, even the, the old preachers, you'll listen to them, they'll say the same stories, something's added to it over and over, a little bit more each time, and it makes them look like a god themselves and makes people worship them and think, wow, what a great man, and all this stuff. It's just vain jangling. You know, the, the best stories come from the Bible. There's a story for every situation in life that you go through in the scriptures, and you need to be getting people and more impressed with the Bible and quit trying to get people impressed with you. When you teach or preach, you want people to become impressed with the Lord and with the Bible, not with you. You're not impressive. The Bible is impressive. The Lord is impressive. And when you can get people interested in the Bible... You're going to lead them to charity out of a pure heart, a good conscience, and a faith unfeigned. Because that's the end of the commandment. That's the result of the Word of God is those things. You're going to lead people to faith. God, you're going to lead them to being edified. You're not going to lead them to more and more questions. But I've, I've already went too long, so... I'm just going to go ahead and hold up there. So we made it to verse 6. We'll start looking at verse 7 next time.